Ah. Okay. I'm just still thinking about Louie. <laughs> kind of ready to get home to my dog. Yeah. Um, in most of my roles, I don't have a title. I don't have authority. I don't have an office as such. In most of my roles, I'm either kind or I'm not. I'm either someone that you can trust or I'm not. Much of what I do, many of the roles that I embody are incarnational kinds of things. It's simple and, and yet it's kind of challenging because in that also comes Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. I must have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. As I stand before you today, I seem to be an individual. You don't see those who've discipled me. You don't see those who've mentored me. You don't see those whom I've discipled and those from whom I've learned. Every time I get to walk with a new believer, it's like my faith is new all over again. And I get to rediscover the joy and the grace and the beauty and the hope and the peace. And it's like, yes, I get to do this. And I love that. I learn as much as I'm discipling somebody, I hope, as what I'm, what I'm helping accompany them with and deliver to them. The people who discipled me, the people who've mentored me, these are the giants upon whose shoulders I stand. The names come to my mind. Some of them were African leaders, Zimbabweans, who bothered to show this white chick at 22 years old how to do ministry well in a context very different from my own. Some of them were in my youth, some of them were right here at Johnson Bible College a couple of decades ago or more. <laughs> These are the giants upon whose shoulders I stand. And I stand before you as one who serves Jesus Christ. And that's pretty much all. With my struggles, with my successes, I just want to serve Jesus. That's all. In our intros, though, in our introductions, we tend to focus on the successes and the accomplishments that people have done. Yet I've learned most of the valuable lessons from my failures. <laughs> Those are the things that stick with me a lot longer. The failures, though, are what qualify me to walk with other people. The failures, the disappointments, the times I got it wrong and learned and sought wisdom. That's what qualifies me to walk with other people. Not my degrees, not my number of years on the field, not my eloquence or my whatever. It's my failures, my struggles. And so I walk with people. I walk with people like Willie, a gangster in New Zealand, who offered to protect my house if any of the other gangs were gonna give me any trouble. His girlfriend was living in our house. And so he said, Miss Jill, if you ever have any trouble with anybody else, you call me and you tell me. I can't do a Kiwi gangster voice very well, sorry. <laughs> and I said, well, Willie, what would you do? He says, I'll sort them out. I'll take care of them. I was like, ooh, Willie. I walked with people like Carol. Significant mental health challenges because of trauma and abuse from people she should have been able to trust. She came and lived in my house. She was a student at the university and she needed a safe place to stay. And so she came and lived in my house for a while. And unfortunately, she ended her life in my house. We're not called to be comfortable. We're called to ask the hard questions and the awkward questions. And we're called to walk with people. <coughs> I got to walk with Anita. Now, you gotta believe this story as I tell it, because parts of it, you just might be a little bit skeptical, but trust me, I know David, he's a good man, right? 
So David was on his way to church one morning, and he saw this woman standing out by the road, and she was, you know, looking for a lift. And so David pulled up, such a good man, and he pulled up next to her, and he said, where are you going? And she said, well, I'm going to, and he says, oh, that's further than I'm going. And she just looked crestfallen and exhausted. And he said, but if you don't mind, and you go to church with me, then you can wait in the car, or you can come in with me, whatever you want to do. But if you go to church with me, then I'll take you to your destination afterwards. David was such a good man that he didn't recognize that she was a prostitute. So David picked her up from the side of the road, and he brought her to church. And she came in the church, and all of us went, woo, <laughs> David's single. <laughs> wow. And that Sunday, the preacher, he's a bit of a prude. He's from East Tennessee, and he graduated from this college. And <clears throat> <laughs> For some reason, he referred to a prostitute in his sermon that Sunday. He, he never does that. <clears throat> but that Sunday, the passage that he was reading, it had to do with the pro And she was like, Anita sat up like, what? And then after the service, she came out and she said, is there somebody I can talk to? So what does everybody in the church do? Chill. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got to have a lovely conversation with Anita. And a couple of us got to pray with Anita. And then David took Anita home. <laughs> and then the next week... David comes again, and he, and he brought Anita. She gave him, he gave her here, I don't know who gave who, whose number. But somehow, she got in touch with him and said, I want to come again. And the prude, who was preaching again, also referred to a prostitute, a different prostitute in the Bible. And I was like, well, is this a series? <laughs> and again, Anita was like, do you guys always talk about this stuff in church? I didn't know I would have come earlier. In time, I started meeting with Anita regularly. I got to disciple Anita. I got to walk along with her as she tried to explore the Bible and understand what was going on and who was Jesus. And she tried to integrate what she had known, who God was, with now another understanding of who God is to her, and then maybe, then therefore, who is Anita? Do you see the pattern? Who is God? Who is God to me? Therefore, who am I? And that was the process I took Anita through. But one day, there was a little glitch in the program. And I got this phone call, and it was my day off. I was just down in my garage, and I was sweeping, and I didn't have a Bible handy. You know, I was sweeping. I had a broom handy. And Anita called, and she's all upset. And I'm like, oh, no, what's gone wrong? And she says, Jill, what you've told me, what you've told me, it just seems too good to be true. And in my life, the way I've been abused and the way I've been used, when something is too good, sounds too good to be true, it usually is. And I said, well, Anita, what's... And she said, you don't know what I've done. And my first thought was, you're right. I have no idea. She said, Jill, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know how my drug use is what took me into prostitution so that I could pray for my drug use at the expense of my children who are now being looked after in the foster system because I couldn't look after them properly. You don't know what I've done. You don't know who I am. And I said, Anita, you remember the scriptures? And she said, yeah, yeah. She said, you know, you've given me lots. I said, go to the one in 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Do any of you know it off the top of your head? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's where I was pointing Anita, right? Can, he will, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I pointed at Anita. I said, get your Bible. It's right here, she said. And I said, okay, go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. So she starts reading to me, and I'm thinking, no. No, Dr. Blevins, years ago, had me memorize. And that, no, no, that, okay, I said, Anita, you're in the wrong John. I said, Anita, you've got to go to, okay, in the Bible, there's a big John, and then there are three little Johns. You shouldn't know what that means. 
For those of you who didn't laugh and are a little bit confused, it sort of has to do with the Roman Empire, I think. <laughs> or not. Um, prostitutes call their clients Johns. So I've just referred to a big John and three little Johns in the Bible, and she's, oh man. Anyway, so once we figured out the obvious miscommunication of this American to the, you know, I said, oh, Anita, I'm so sorry. I said, go to the back of your Bible, and it's, you know, it's, in, you know, whatever. And then we read it again, and I said, Anita, what does it say? Read it to me. And she said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I said, most unrighteousness. And she's like, no, no, it says, I said, some unrighteousness. And she said, no, no, it says, and I said, a little bit of unrighteousness. And she says, no, Jill, it says all. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> what part don't you get, girl? She said, but you don't know what I've done. And I said, but Jesus does. And as the verse I read the very first day in Romans chapter 5, he demonstrated his great love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's just not about us. It's about him. And a lot of the verb tenses are past tense. It's what he's already done. I don't serve the church. I don't serve the church as a job. My Christology, who I know Jesus to be, my Christology informs my missiology, what I do and how I live. My Christology informs my missiology, which then determines my ecclesiology, how I do church. We sometimes jumble that around. And we think that the mission is the job of the church. When in actual fact, in my opinion, the church is the outcome of mission. And it all comes from Jesus, my Lord and my Savior. Do we have a slide that talks about the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Um, I serve Jesus by loving people who will and do form the church. And to me, that is the Lordship of Jesus Christ lived out in my life. We're supposed to ask better questions, right? My question to you today is how does the Lordship, what does the Lordship of Jesus Christ look like in your life? If the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the norm, then everything else is Few words come to mind, but I don't think I'm allowed to say them in chapel. <laughs> Rubbish. That's a New Zealand term for trash or garbage. Everything else, everything else is extra. Everything else is unnecessary. Everything else is temporary. Everything else is like manufactured. The living the lordship of Jesus Christ is the norm for me, for those who are called to have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. So I wrestle with awkward questions in weird places, and I walk with people in the messiness of their lives, because Jesus did. It's really that simple to me. I don't like to should on people. Do you like to be should upon? You gotta read my lips, don't you? I don't like to should on people, but, you know, anytime the but comes and you know that ah, she's going to do it. What are the questions we should be asking as people preparing for ministry in whatever career path, vocation, trajectory you're on? What are the questions we should be asking of ourselves, of our studies, of the scripture, of God? What are the questions we should be asking? What are the questions the church should be asking? Are we asking the right questions? Are we asking the better questions? Shall we perpetuate a consumeristic religious identity? You know, I'm a Christian, I'm this type of a Christian, and I'm gonna keep being this type. Or do I have an intimate, life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. I think those are two different things. 
Do you have an intimate, life-giving relationship with Jesus? Do you have ears to hear the gospel, the call of Jesus on your life? We're going to give you an opportunity if you want it. Now, I used to play softball, and I was okay at it when I was younger, but I just remember one of the things that the coach would always say was, you know, kind of stay on your toes. How many athletes do we have in the room here? Whether you're on a, on a Johnson team or intramural, you got a lot of athletes in here? Good. Now, I'm an old girl, so I don't have it right really anymore, but, but is it true with basketball, with soccer, with softball, with volleyball, with any of those things? We're not supposed to have our feet stuck to the floor, are we? We're supposed to be, I, I can't, we're supposed to be ready to move. We're supposed to be poised for action and movement. Are you ready to move? Are you ready to move? Do you have ears to hear? Is your heart soft? Are your hands open to receive the call that Jesus has on your life? Are your feet stuck to the floor? Or are you poised and ready for the next play? If so, there are people who are ready to pray with you and pray for you. Somebody asked the earliest question, was I an independent or did I go out with a sending agency? It's stinking hard to do stuff on your own. It is so much easier to walk with somebody, to be discipled or mentored or just have somebody to pray with you. And so there are people prepared all around the room today to pray with you. Not that you're going to go be a missionary necessarily. Not that you're going to do some crazy next big things, though I've heard some amazing plans from some of you this week, and it's really been encouraging to me. Just, are you willing? Are your ears open to hear? And you just want to pray with somebody, just maybe for some clarity. Maybe you know the call that God has on your life. Maybe you don't, but you'd really, 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 really like to. Maybe you don't know who you are. And you'd like clarity on that. Are you willing to move? If so, now's a chance for you to get up out of your seat and not go around the world necessarily, but just go to the edges of the room and pray with somebody while the band plays. Do you want to be more like Jesus? Do you want to have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus? Ask somebody to pray with you about that. Lord Jesus, I just pray right here, right now, that you will reveal yourself to each and every one of us according to the gifts, talents, and abilities you've put in us. The very essence of you is in our hearts and in our minds, in our souls. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you will reveal yourself to us right now, today, exactly as we need to see you. Not packaged for anybody else not explained, dissected, or boxed up. Lord Jesus, reveal yourself exactly as I need to see you.